This is the App Store page for our own compressor audio unit for iOS. This is not the subject of the video, but I'm going to mention this a few times in the video, so I'm showing it to you now. The main subject of the video is something that will be helpful to you when you're using a compressor to do mixing. And specifically, there are two takeaway lessons that you're going to understand by the time we get to the end of this rather long video. The first one is that bass frequencies will be distorted more heavily by a compressor than high frequencies. And the second one, which you'll see in a few minutes is directly related to the first, the release time controls the amount of distortion specifically longer release times have less distortion and shorter release times have more so if you're getting a lot of saturation from your compressor and you don't want it you need to increase the release time or if you want more of the saturation tone that your compressor has decrease the release time and you'll get more in this video i'll talk a little bit about how compressors work and i hope that this will give you some insight into the compressor settings that you want to use when you're applying a compressor to your mixes the first thing i want to do is just a, a, a quick overview of what a compressor does internally there are three main steps the first thing it needs to do is measure i'm going to say monitor the volume uh, i'm saying monitor and i'm spelling it wrong because uh, obviously the volume is changing moment to moment and so we need to have something um, something inside the compressor that monitors that and we call that component an envelope follower envelope follower the next thing that the compressor does is if the volume is too loud turn it down and then of course if it's not too loud, like if, it, if it, the level goes back down, volume, uh, then turn it back up. Uh, turn it back up doesn't usually mean boost the volume, but just put it, put it back to the original uh, volume wherever it was before. Any compressor you have is basically going to be doing these, these three things. It has to have some component that's mo monitoring the volume. And, and as I said before, we're calling that an envelope follower. And then it's somehow turning the volume down when it's too loud and turning it back up when it's, uh, when it's not too loud anymore. That's very basic, but I just want to make sure that's clear before we start looking at how this actually works. Now, steps two and three are so simple that uh, I'm not going to talk about them tone is going to come from how we monitor the volume. In other words, how we design the envelope follower. And this is where there's a lot of interesting uh, information for us to talk about and for you to uh, use as you're doing mixes. So let's talk about how the envelope follower works. What I have here on the screen is a sound wave, uh, the blue line. Right? Let's imagine that represents a sound wave at a relatively low frequency. So this is, a, this is about a five hertz wave. The first thing that the envelope follower usually needs to do is rectify the signal. Up here, envelope one, it needs to rectify the signal. So rectify the signal means if the signal has positive and negative components, it needs to do something so that we have only positive. So in this case, in this example, I'm going to take the absolute value of the signal. Now that's something that analog electronics don't do very well. Uh, so there's an argument over whether we should use the square function or the absolute value function. I'll show you what happens if we use the square. So if I use the square function, I get the, the yellow-orange color line. And if I rectify using absolute value, I get the green line. And some people argue that the yellow, the yellow way is better because it has it smooth down here on the bottom. It doesn't create this sharp discontinuity. Whether or not that's true will depend on what, what kind of smoothing filters that, <coughs> that we're employing. The blue line you're looking at is the original input signal. And you can see the rectified signal overlaps the input signal when the input is positive. But when the input goes negative, then the rectified signal, instead of going down below zero, it goes back up. So you can see the rectified signal uh, has twice as many peaks. Uh, if, we, if, we, if, we count the, yeah, if we count the peaks, 
it ends up having twice as many as the original. If we, if we use a square rectifier, you can actually see that my rectified signal is, is uh, an octave higher than the input signal. So I've, I've created one uh, higher harmonic just by squaring it like that. The next thing I want to talk about is that if we just rectified like this and, and we try to say that, okay, here's our envelope follower, there's a major problem with this because you can see this, if we were to take this orange line as the volume of this signal, the volume is following the wave up and down. So every time the wave is near zero, uh, the volume is going down to zero. And that's not really what we want. Um, if you watch my mouse cursor, w what we would want if we were, I'm going to zero out the orange line. I think the ideal volume envelope we'd like to see is something that follows this blue line up, but when it gets to the top here, instead of coming down again, we'd like it to go straight across and connect the peaks because, uh, let's look at a higher frequency wave. That's 50 hertz. Let's take it all the way up to 500 hertz. Okay, then now it's really clear. When this wave is, is, is at a higher frequency, we very clearly see that the amplitude of this wave is, is this flat line along the top. And absolutely, the amplitude would be inappropriate for the amplitude to be following each one of these waves going down. And in, indeed, if we look at a, comp uh, a real envelope follower that's working inside a compressor, most of them, when the frequency gets higher, they're, they're going to have a very easy time to, to draw a straight line across the top of these peaks. But for lower frequencies, that's not so easy, and I'll show you why. Um, let's imagine that the, the frequency is back down to 5 hertz like this. Uh, if I'm designing an envelope follower, I'm watching the signal, and as it's going up, I'm going, yep, it's rising, the volume's rising, it gets to here, and now I'm saying to myself, I'm not going to follow it back down again. I'm just going to hold this across. I know that it's going to come back up again, and yes, it does. It comes across, and so I, you know, I connect to this peak, and so I'm going to connect across all the peaks. But the problem is that I can't see the future. So let's say when I get to this point, I don't know if this is the last wave, if, if, the, if the sound is going to stop after this, or if there's going to be another one. So I don't really know when I should, I mean, obviously, if the wave isn't over yet, now that we're looking at this graph of the whole history, we can all see that the envelope follower should, if it were ideal, should connect a straight line across here. But from the envelope follower's perspective, operating in real time when it can't see what's coming next, every time it reaches a peak, it, it doesn't know if it should go straight across and hope for another peak to come, or if it should drop down and, and follow the, the wave as it goes down. So when we design an envelope follower, well, let's, let's run it. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to show you the, yeah, I'm going to show you the rectified input here. And I'm going to show you an envelope follower following this. All right, I'm going to turn off the original input just to simplify the graph a little bit. Right. So what we see now is the orange line is the rectified input, and the green line is the envelope follower. And this is a real envelope follower. I've got the code, I've got part of the code here, and more of the code up here. And you can see what it's doing is it's following up uh, with the envelope. The green line is following the yellow line up, but it's lagging behind a little bit. And that's because I've set the attack time at 5 milliseconds. If I would set the attack time at 50 milliseconds, for example, you'll see the green line lags behind even more. So this number here is attack time, and this is my release time, which I currently have set at 270 milliseconds. And these, these are the two parameters that are really controlling uh, how the envelope follower works, and then ultimately, because the compressor turns the volume up or down according to what the envelope follower is doing, these are the key, really the two key parameters in the, in the, in the compressor. Let's, let's go back to 5 milliseconds attack, because uh, just for this demonstration, I want to follow closely to the original input, input signal. And then I've got a longer release, so I'm going straight up with the wave, and then I'm very slowly coming down, and going straight up and then slowly coming down. So this is working better. If we, if we just look at the envelope, I'm going to zero out the uh, rectified signal. What we've got here is now something more like what we would like to see when we're looking at the, you know, if we were asked what's the volume of this sound. 
But it's, it's not ideal that this is bouncing up and down because what would happen if we, if we come back to our, uh, our compressor principles, if when we monitor the volume, we incorrectly uh, measure the envelope and our volume seems to be bouncing up and down when in fact that's just the oscillation of the wave, then we're going to start turning the volume down and back up again with every wave oscillation and that creates distortion. Now, if, depending on how we do that, it might create a nice kind of saturation that we like, or it might create ugly distortion that we don't like, but it's definitely not going to give us a clear sound either way. What we can do to get less distortion is we can just increase the uh, release time. So from 270 milliseconds, I'm going to go to 870 milliseconds. And you'll see now, because I'm releasing more slowly, the envelope follower has a flatter, uh, a flatter top on it. But if you've used a compressor, you know 870 milliseconds is a long release time. That's almost one second. Let's look at how far I would have to go up to get this release to actually look, look like it's drawing a flat line. I'm at 1.8 seconds release time. Obviously, this is way too long, but there's uh, good news for us. This input signal is only at 5 hertz, and we don't really need our compressor to work properly at 5 hertz. We would like it to work on the audio range, so ideally I'd like it to work well down, right down to 20 hertz. So let's look at what happens at 20 hertz. Now our envelope follower is working pretty well. Um, I'm going to zero out the input. If you see it has these little zigzags in the, in the line at the top, but more or less it is now connecting straight across the top of these waves. But this is, of course, this is way too much release time. Uh, or a normal release time would be between 50 milliseconds and uh, maybe 50 and 250. Um, so if we're here at 270, or let's make it let's make it 250, we're definitely doing better with the the 20 hertz wave than we were with the 5 hertz. I'm going to go back to the 5 hertz so you can compare. So here at 5 hertz, this wave is just so slow that there's no way that we can design an envelope follower that releases in a reasonable amount of time and and, and still actually gets the volume envelope correct. Um, and that's okay, because we don't really need to get the volume correct at 5 hertz, because we can't hear that anyway. Let's look at what happens at 100 hertz. So when we get up to 100 hertz, we still see some zigzags here, but, uh, but this is really, really close um, to the correct volume envelope, to, to what we, uh, we want to see when we um, run a compressor like this. Let's take the release time down to 50 milliseconds. That's 0, 5, 0. Let's see what happens. So now as the, we're at, this is a 100 hertz input signal, and I've got my release time set at 50 milliseconds. And you can see right here, uh, I've got a lot of zigzagging in, my, um, in the top of my envelope, and this is going to lead directly to having distortion in my, in my input signal we need to have the ability to have fast attack times so that we can, we can respond quickly when the volume changes. But we don't necessarily need the release times to be so fast. And so as we designed this envelope follower, we're counting on the release part of the envelope follower to smooth out that, that signal for us because we can't count on the attack to do it because we need the attack to be short. The compressor envelope follower that we use actually runs several additional stages of filtering and by doing that it comes out with a much uh, flatter envelope. So now I've modified the code and I'm going to run our own envelope follower. The real This is the real one that's uh, identical to the one that's actually in our Blue Mango compressor. And now you see this one follows the input up and then it's extremely flat across the top. I'm going to hide the input so that we can see if there's any small zigzags in the top, and you don't see any. <clears throat> but if we, um, if we reduce the frequency of the input, like if we take it down to 5 hertz, you will see this one does, uh, it does do zigzagging. It just doesn't do it very much. It doesn't do it in any frequencies in the audio range. So this is why uh, we were able to get such low distortion out of, of the design we're using. So this is the way the uh, typical envelope follower uh, handles the release envelope. The one that we are using 
And the one that we're using in the Blue Mango compressor is identical to the one you're seeing in this video. And it has this property that it, it holds almost flat for a time. Now it's important to note it's not actually flat here. It's just that the, if we think in terms of physics, the acceleration which, which this, with which this line falls down is not a constant rate acceleration. So in this case, I'm looking at how the envelope follower responds to a 50 hertz sine wave when it suddenly stops. So you'll see, as soon as it stops, it does start releasing. It looks flat, but it's, it's not. It's very slowly picking up speed. And then as it comes down, it will start to pick up speed and go faster and faster and then plunge down to zero. If we compare that to a more typical compressor design, we see that the more typical one starts off falling almost immediately after the, the sound wave stops, and then it actually tapers off its falling speed toward the end. So this one, uh, in terms of um, not creating distortion, this is almost exactly the opposite of what we want. What does this mean for you in terms of using a compressor to do mixing? The main thing that you can take away from this is that the shorter you make the, the release time and the attack time, but especially the release time, and it depends on, on which compressor you're using, but the shorter you make those times, the more the envelope follower is going to have difficulty getting a straight line estimate of what the volume actually is. And the more the envelope follower starts jumping up and down like this, the more distortion you get in your signal. And as I said before, having distortion is not necessarily a bad thing, depending on how the compressor is designed. The way that it, it gives its own unique style of distortion is what gives the compressor its unique tone. But on the other hand, uh, if you don't want distortion, the first thing to do is there is to look for a compressor that, that has less distortion. Uh, but the other thing is to adjust the release time. So if you're getting distortion and you don't want to be getting it, increase the release time. Or if you're not getting it and you want more, take the release time down lower and you're going to hear more of the, the tone that comes out of that compressor. The other thing that's really important to note here is that the amount of distortion depends on the input signal frequency. So um, you can see we're getting a certain level of, of uh, discontinuity and zigzag up at the top of this envelope follower. But if I were to go to 5,000 hertz, for example, it would become perfectly, almost perfectly flat. So the, the key thing to know here is that if your compressor is getting a, a, a lot of distorted sound on bass frequencies, like if you're down near 20 hertz like this, and this level of distortion isn't acceptable for you, understand that when you're working with bass frequencies, you're going to need to use a, a longer uh, release time in order, to, uh, in order to avoid that problem. I'm going to lengthen the release time and we'll look at this. 500 milliseconds release time. And you can see that that reduced the distortion by, I don't know, 40% or so. But uh, there's a limit to, to how well this is going to work because obviously you don't want your release time enormously huge because you, you do need some, some sort of um, quick response out of your compressor. So that's the end of this short tutorial, and I hope that has been helpful for you in your mixing. If you want to see more videos like this, remember to hit the subscribe button below this video.